Bernadette Jackson moved around a lot as a kid. She is the daughter of James Jackson, who was an ambulance driver in the Pacific during World War II, who picked up um, a lot of meat at Pearl Harbor. She is the granddaughter of Charles Jackson, who was a West Virginian miner who um, Jean Valjean a two-ton coal cart off of somebody to save their life down in the mine. She's also the great-granddaughter of Thomas Jackson, who was an Oxford-educated Methodist circuit writer, who some of you have heard about before. I call this woman uh, Bernadette. I actually don't call her that, uh, because I did once as a child, and she almost shot put me across the back acre. Um, I call her Graham. She is my father's mother. She is, due to a number of life circumstances, uh, resilient perhaps the most resilient person that I know. I grew up spending the first couple of Tuesdays and every other weekend in the years following my parents' divorce at her place on Coates Road in Oxford, Michigan, where my father grew up and attended the local Free Methodist Church and the public high school. My dad lived with her and her second husband before he moved to where he is now. But before my grandmother settled on Coates Road, she lived in a number of places, but kind of mostly Pontiac, Michigan, and then Florida, and then West Virginia, but eventually just Pontiac, where as a child, she attended the elementary school and lived in a shanty on cinder blocks that had no kitchen and no bathroom. When I complained about how cold her house was as a child, uh, those Tuesdays and every other weekend, she reminded me that she used to put hot coals in a cast iron skillet and wrap an afghan around that and place that at the foot of her bed during a winter to keep warm. So really, truly, what on earth did I have to complain about? Her Sunday dinners were a Midwestern Europe, European American smorgasbord of fresh produce and unseasoned chicken. I will say that it had some seasoning. It did have salt and pepper. She made warm, delicious bread from scratch, kneaded through with elbow grease and yeast and survival skills built generations deep. She grows her own vegetables to this day, um, but had a marvel of a garden on Coates Road where she grew beans, garlic, onions, strawberries, watermelons, raspberries, squash, just to name like a few. In my mind's eye, I see her fearlessly picking up a snake by its tail and kind of just throwing it from the garden like Eve would do in the ideal retelling of Genesis. Before I left for seminary, I talked with her in the kitchen about um, epigenetics, how um, trauma is transmitted through genetics, through inheritance of these genetics, and how the sons of Union soldiers held in Confederate prison camps suffered higher rates of chronic illnesses and heart disease and susceptibility to trauma themselves, long before we understood what shell shock or let alone trauma is. And how wasn't that at least just interesting? And she nodded into the dishes that she was cleaning and said nothing. But I remembered visiting her father, my great-grandfather James. As a child in the hills of Maryland and eventually West Virginia, he was an ambulance driver in the Pacific again during World War II. And I remember my brother once on a summer visit wanting to watch cartoon Batman on the TV off, uh, off of the room, uh, in, the, in the TV of the room off the kitchen. Um, and so some 60, year, some 60 or so years later after this attack on Pearl Harbor, um, where, uh, during which my grand grandfather was present, he threw what, my wife, what his wife called a real proper fit in the room off the kitchen where he was watching his program, despite my brother's protest to watch cartoon Batman. And as a student of trauma studies, I am sympathetic to this. I can understand now this memory that I have as a child of a confusing incident in which my great-grandfather's sudden and shocking rage, his abysmal emotional dysregulation as a result of his military service, the result of his post-traumatic stress, was on full display. These memories I have resurfaced some more that I heal from my own trauma, and in these lessons, my ancestors are teaching me the riches of their wisdom, that there are lessons to be learned from what we inherit from our kin, the powerful and the painful and even the perfectly ordinary. There are lessons of survival to be learned from our ancestors if we are simply brave enough to sit and listen. I think not only of my great-grandfather Jackson and his daughter, but of the other folks I have the honor of calling kin. As a Christian, my kin is not only my blood family, but people of all kinds whose existence helps me coalesce more into my being. 
like my kin in creativity, like Leo and Hildegard, my kin in harm reduction, like Sylvia and Dan, in radical thought, like Fred and Simone, and in fictive kin, like Jay and Emily and Jack, and the other witnesses that are here on this plane or gone on to the next that I know and love. The becoming and the being of these other people helps in the being and becoming of myself. And just like they create my being, so do you. As the body of Christ, this church helps create and recreate me through the relationships I have with you, both through my individual and our collective relationship with the divine. And I hope that I am as a, much a part of your process of becoming and being, of creating and recreating yourselves as well. And I hope we see ourselves in the process of that, in the manifold image of God in our collective body. And yet, I also see that there is an ache in you that there are things that you have had to survive to even just to make it here on Sunday morning, to be reflected and to reflect. Part of the survival wisdom that I am learning from my ancestors, both my fictive ancestors and my consanguineous ancestors, is that there are stories about the past that we tell ourselves in order to be able to move forward. We are creating and recreating meaning out of the suffering in our past in an effort to envision and equip ourselves for a different future. We tell stories of our father's fight in World War II or of a cast iron skillet wrapped in an Afghan or a cartoon Batman to teach lessons to our children to explain something confusing or to keep the image of God intact within ourselves in the midst of senseless suffering. Our ancestors' stories of survival are the ways that we progress and I don't mean this in some strange romanticization of the past in which we blindly ignored the problems of these periods and whitewash our history in an effort to return to some mythic, mythic being the operative word, long lost ideal. I don't mean that and also in, our, in like kind of an anarcho-primitivist way either, um, but rather that within our being, within all that is coalesced into our being, that this being is co constantly coalescing around the experiences of people who are past, people who are present, and people who are in our futures. These are lessons for our survival in an uncertain age. As tides shift and change, the lessons of our ancestors, from our ancestors of survival, can be learned by retrieving both our ancestors' accomplishments and also their mistakes. I am reminded of the West African Adinkra symbol of the Sankofa bird, which is a word in the Twi language that means to retrieve. That means it is good to go back and fetch what was left behind. I am reminded when I remember my great grandfather and his father before him and his father before him and the many children who came after them of the lessons that I can learn from the pain of their past. Lessons to treat children gently Lessons that I ought to learn to regulate my emotions, ought to learn to soothe myself if I want to aid in the soothing of others. Lessons of frugality and dignity of, and making meaning, lessons of how to grow food for your community. As the children of our ancestors, ancestors by blood or by love, living or with the saints, we have to be able to wade through the pain of their stories to find their wisdom. Our text for today, found in 1 Kings, shows a young Solomon, anywhere from 12 to 15, depending on which scholars you read, and he's dreaming of a vision, and in this vision, God bestows upon him the wisdom that he asks for, to be a discerning leader for his people and to lead as led by the Lord like his father, David. He's a young teenager when he has the, the breadth of knowledge and the wherewithal to ask for this, for anything in the world, for wisdom. If God asked me what I wanted when I was 12, anything at all, I would have said panic at the disco tickets. <laughs> he says to God of David, you have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on this throne this very day. And yet we know from the story of David's life that there was a son. There were many sons before Solomon, but one that he had with Bathsheba, Solomon's mother, before Solomon, the woman whose husband David had killed and the woman whose David coerced into a sexual relationship. This infant lived seven days before dying. And I imagine that this was known to Solomon, who would eventually become king through Bathsheba's machinations, that he'd had a brother who was born out of this relationship, 
In my sanctified imagination, I imagine that he knew about the death of his mother's first husband, though maybe perhaps not the circumstances. And as I re read this text, I see that it is as much a pro-Solomon polemic who became king through these machinating means, but also a trauma text about Solomon. It's as much a pro-Solomon text about him as David's son, as much as it is a text about his trauma as Bathsheba's son. She was a woman who, in the middle of the night, was summoned by armed palace guards to present herself to the king. She became pregnant, and to cover the scandal of the pregnancy and his complicity, David had her husband killed. Again, in my sanctified imagination, I see Solomon's knowledge of these actions and the pain he has to account for in his own life before assuming power over others' lives. Whether we are a parent or a teacher or a pastor, a mentor, whatever, before we assume care or power over our community, no matter how big or how small, you know, even if the community is between you and yourself, there's a wisdom on reflecting on the pain of our ancestors, knowing it, how it manifests and is present in ourselves today as well. And since these are the lessons from the lives of other people who have lived, we turn to God. We turn to God, our parent, who is the starting point of our relationship to our ancestors, the great cloud of witnesses that stands before us and behind us. As a family of believers gathered in body or in spirit in this corner of 56th and Woodlawn, when faced with questions of our imminent future, we ought to, like the Sankofa bird and like Solomon, be unafraid to reach back and retrieve the lessons of the past, even if it means miring through the pain of our ancestors to arrive at their wisdom. The past is not disposable. It is a rich wealth of information about how we ought to conduct ourselves, lest we see the same old banal evil continue to thrive, the evil of militarism, of the prison industrial complex, of poverty, of every other normalized system of violence that contributes not only to our honest separation from ourselves to the past, but from ourselves with one another and ourselves with ourselves. And as well, in a similar vein, we ought to entrust the future to those who are heirs to it. Amen. We ought to use the lessons of the past to imagine, a f to imagine and inspire future generations towards thriving and towards justice, to a place where righteousness is the rule of the land and not greed. We ought to look back at moments such as the human cost of military conflict and moments of racial injustice and create safeguards against these same mistakes again. We ought to confront the degradation of gender minorities in this country, of women, women who are cis and of trans or non-binary experience, and also of all people who fall outside of the gender binary. We ought to be able to actually teach these moments, to make this history accessible, to allow it to influence our intentions of the future. But we, speaking now as um, Gen Z, the oldest of Gen Z, speaking now as a young leader, I want to say we have to be trusted with this future and that there must be mutual, mutual trust that goes this way, that goes that way, between and amongst generations. Humility to say, teach me, and to also accept the responsibility of teaching. This work of imagining a future, a coming kingdom, takes the work of many generations, too many to count. It takes waves of us being willing to wade into the pain and discomfort of the past, but also into the arms of the clouds of witnesses for the wisdom. It takes being able to retrieve the past in a way that is precious and tender enough with the lessons that we carry, to that we retrieve to carry them into the future. They are tiny these lessons, and they are precious, and they're particular, kind of like yeast. And at the time that Jesus preaches from a, large, from a boat to a large crowd, maybe too many to count, gathered along the shoreline, as it's written in Matthew 13, at the time that he gives this parable of the yeast or of the leaven, the process of creating yeast was just by allowing the batch of the last dough, of the last loaf, to catch the yeast of the air. Yeast is a fungi that grows in the air, and you have to have a piece of the previous generation to create bread for the current generation. You have to retain and retrieve the lessons of the past to bring about a future kingdom. People, the kingdom of God is vast. It's manifold. It is an elemental miracle. 
It is wonder and magic and wisdom and imagination well rooted in the lessons, both the accomplishments and the failures of the past. When we remember our ancestors as broken or as glorious as they might have been, we honor their memory simply by learning from it, by that critical and essential retrieval of their story and of their memory. Because in their being, we are rooted and we are constantly created and recreated, telling the story of our being as rooted in the network of our loving and compassionate relationships with one another, vast and reaching, up and under, as above and so below. Amen.